I think the problem with the AI program is that we don't really have a clear understanding of what we mean by intelligence. Um, computers can do things now that used to be thought the exclusive preserve of human beings. Things like playing chess well uh, or classifying things that uh, are presented to you know, the observer system. Um, so there's been, I think, enormous progress, such that if you told Alan Turing, you know, in 1950, what we can do now with computers, he would have said, ah, they're intelligent. But we don't think they are, because there are limits to what they can do. Um, I think it's probably better to say that we're getting smarter and smarter machines. Uh, I don't think there's a threshold at which we can say, ah, they are now sentient. Right? In a sense, an electronic camera is sentient. It responds to its environment. Right? It can focus, it can adjust the aperture, it can um, record um, you know, all sorts of things, record motion. Uh, that's stimulus and response to the environment. Right? It's, it's not merely passive, it's actively engaging with its environment. I think that's probably all that there really is to sentience and intelligence. All the rest is just complexity. How much more complex can you make that system? So human beings model the world, but we model our modeling of the world. And if we're really good at it, we can model our modeling of the modeling. But we reach a point where upon which we just can't keep track of what we're doing. Um, and in that respect, we're just like any other system that interacts with its world in, a, in, in an active fashion. Uh, so uh, I, I think that we set expectations way too high and way too narrowly when we started artificial intelligence by focusing in on symbolic reasoning as if that was all that really mattered to intelligence. Um, symbolic reasoning, however, is something, you, you've got to ask, who set that up as the criterion? And the answer is, academics did. And what do academics do really well? Symbolic reasoning. So they invented AI in their own image. But, you know, somebody who's really good at carving wood has an enormous amount of intelligence in what they're doing, right? We call it skill. But why is that particularly different? It's using neural circuitry, right? It's training neural circuitry to be able to manipulate these things. Uh, why is that not intelligence? And I think that probably uh, we are so focused on the intellectual aspects of intelligence because that's how the academic world set it up that we've just um, ignored so much of everything else that really matters about intelligence. Uh, there's a joke that IQ is a measure of what it is that IQ tests measure. Um, it's not a measure of intelligence per se. Actually, IQ tests are a pretty good measure of how well you'll do it in an academic environment, which tells you all you need to know about IQ tests. Um, I think we would be better off saying, how can we make systems which ne negotiate the world well if not as well as we do, then better than they do right now. And when you get to that point, you'll have something that you look at and say, yep, that's a smart machine. And that's all you really should expect. I do think that we can extend artificial intelligence based upon our uh, knowledge of the human brain. After all, that's how we started it, right? The whole idea of a neurista was an idealized neuron. As we learn more about the brain, we will start to pick up on a whole lot of um, uh, ideas and techniques that we hadn't thought of because evolution's pretty damn clever. And it's had uh, around about 660 million years since the first uh, neural uh, system evolved. And uh, it's done quite a lot of really interesting things in that time. So we can learn a lot by seeing what, what's happened, save ourselves uh, a lot of effort. I don't, though, think that that's the only type of intelligence. And there may be types of intelligence that machines 
are far better at. There are, we know, types of intelligence that machines are far better at than anything that we can do. For example, storing and retrieving lists. They do that so much better than we do. Um, and I think that um, the idea that somehow all that's going on in our head is a kind of computation, uh, I think that's fundamentally mistaken. Uh, physical differences make a big difference. And the difference between a computer and a human brain is worlds apart. You know, it's, it's massive. So we might get hints from the human brain on how to, to make machines more intelligent, or we might find that some of those things are simply dead ends for uh, something that's, you know, silicon and electronic. Um, for a start, most of what happens in our head, right, is highly chemical, which introduces all kinds of propagation delays, uh, rhythms and so forth. So what's going on in our head may be something that it's really just too damned hard to implement on a computer. Uh, that said, I think a lot of what we're going to um, uh, learn from, about the brain over the next 50 years or so is quite literally going to blow our minds. You know, we are going to find out stuff that is just astonishing. And if the last 50 years have been the, uh, uh, the era of molecular biology, the next 50 are going to be the era of, the, uh, of neuroscience and the brain. Now, having said that, if the question were, will we be able to upload ourselves into computers, I will unequivocally, and I don't often give an unequivocal answer, but I will unequivocally say no. For the reason that we talked about before, the map is not the territory, the model is not the thing being modeled. You can have as accurate and fine-grained a description of me as you like, put it into a computer, it will not be me. It will behave in ways that are quite different to the way I would have behaved. And that's because of the physical substrate. It's quite different. So the transhumanist view that somehow we're going to be able to put ourselves into computers and live forever, well, something will be there and doing some interesting stuff. But to be honest, it won't be me in any sense that really matters. Uh, so it's a nice idea, but I, I think it's really just a bit of a pipe dream. All right, so the ship of Theseus problem is the idea that if you replace all of the parts on Theseus's ship and keep the old ones, right, at some point you'll have enough parts to rebuild the original ship, which one is the ship of Theseus? This was a, uh, uh, an argument put by Thomas Hobbes. And you could say we could replace our cells with nanites and eventually at some point we'd be entirely technological and entirely unbiological. Here's my reason for thinking that won't happen. First of all, what you're really doing there is appealing to a similarity of function. So I'd replace a cell with something that wasn't made of biological matter, but which behaved like a cell. For example, a nerve cell, right? Um, what counts as the functionally important things? For example, glial cells appear now to be important for memory. We didn't know that uh, even as recently as 10 years ago, right? We thought it was all just, you know, standing wave patterns of firing in neurons. It turns out, no, glial cells are actually important parts of where we store our memories. Now, if you had said, oh, all I need is something functionally equivalent to a neuron and replaced all the neurons and then said, right, we don't need all the other stuff, you would have a version of me that had no memory. And this has got to be true for every physical difference. They all make a difference, right? Replace one molecule with something different and you will get different physical outcomes. So the question is, are they significant enough functionally? And since we don't have a full functional specification of what it is to be a human being, right? We don't know ahead of time what's going to matter. So if you replaced parts of me with machines, little tiny nanites, right? at some point they'd start behaving differently than if you had cells there. 
right? You're not getting osmosis. You're not getting uh, chemical signaling going on. You're not getting this or that. And maybe that's not important, but probably it is. So my argument is, it's a physicalist argument. If we are just physical things, and I believe we are, right, then functional differences are just abstractions. Right? And to say this is functionally equivalent to that is to say, well, as far as I'm concerned right now, that's good enough. But it will make a difference, and those differences will multiply. And so I don't think that the, argue, the ship of Theseus argument is a good one because you're not replacing wood with wood. You're replacing wood with aluminium siding or whatever. And it behaves differently in water, in bearing weights, in uh, how you repair it, what happens when you're away from uh, the ship dock and all this sort of stuff. Theseus' ship would be very different if you replaced the old traditional materials with new non-traditional materials. And I think the same thing is going to be true of human beings.